Hello, welcome back to the Cubase Fundamentals tutorial series. Today we're embarking on a three-part um, little mini-series where we're going to discuss one single problem and that is how to coordinate all of these various pieces of equipment that we have together, both hardware and software and the overarching DAW. How do we get them all talking the same language? Now originally that's what MIDI was designed for. The MIDI protocol was invented to allow musical instruments to talk to each other. And it works fantastically. It's an incredibly robust language, but there are deficiencies about it. And so there's been an evolution of that concept called automation. Automation tries to take the best parts of the MIDI protocol and make them appropriate to modern needs and demands. The problem with automation is that it's door specific. And so we need some bridge between the pieces of hardware that we've got and this improved protocol and in Cubase they're implemented as uh, quick controls. So over the course of the next three episodes we're going to examine each of those three concepts uh, individually. Before we embark on all of that if you check out the link below to my Patreon page you'll be able to download a copy of this project, follow along with me side by side and you'll also be helping out uh, me and my channel as we go. Right let's get on with it. The challenge for the day and all of this is in the context of writing our song. I want to write a new part into this chorus, but in addition to recording just notes, I'm going to record some extra information as well. I'm going to do some pitch bend and I'm going to do some continuous controller recording. Now MIDI CC, or continuous controller, is the part of the MIDI protocol that automation has really picked up and evolved. But for today's purposes, we're going to restrict ourselves exclusively to only dealing with the MIDI side of things. A couple of very tiny pieces of housekeeping. I need to turn this monitor off that I'd left on from the previous episode and I need to delete this unnecessary track and I'll just move that up there. All is well. Now up until now I've used the Steinberg Prolog as the synthesizer of choice. That's not good enough for the purpose of um, discussion of MIDI because it, it doesn't support MIDI CC data. And so I'm going to add an instance of Halley and Sonic SE. So, so this thing comes with all versions of Cubase, we should be fine. And I'm going to load the bright pop bell sound. Okay, here we've got this sound and I just need to turn it down a little bit because it's a bit loud. And I'm going to record some pitch bend. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's have a look at that in the event editor before we go any further. I'll just quantize it. Now at first glance, it doesn't look like there's any pitch bend data in there, but there is. This thing at the bottom where we've got our velocities is a controller lane, and you can have multiple controller lanes. Click this little plus button, and you'll see that pitch bend has a little black mark next to it. That means there's some pitch bend data in this MIDI part. If I select pitch bend, it'll create a second controller lane for us. Now if I make the editor a little bit bigger we can have a look at this. So I'll just cycle around the first four bars where the pitch bend data is and if I really zoom in you can see that everything is horizontal. All of these changes go from one fixed value to another fixed value. That's the nature of MIDI. Every single one of these points is a MIDI pitch bend message that's being recorded in the MIDI part and is sending information to the synthesizer that's installed on this track, Halley and Sonic in this case, to say do something, increase the pitch by this much. Now you can see that when the data is being recorded it's basically being quantized but we can override that. If I turn the um, grid off, snap off, I can choose my pencil tool and draw any amount of smoothness. Now having done that, if I turn snap back on and draw a line in the opposite direction, you get this quite strange behavior. It's a little bit difficult at first to figure out what's going on. 
if there's MIDI data to be changed, the editing tool will allow you to change data at the same level of granularity. However, if there are no MIDI events, like in this span here, and I try to draw some lines, it'll only let me do it according to the currently set quantize level. So if I set the quantize to 128, it will now let me draw more points in between here. But if I turn grid off, and absolutely fill the zone with dots. From that point onwards, the grid is subservient to the points that already exist. It'll let me carry on drawing at this very fine grain. So it's a little bit weird getting your head around manual uh, manipulation of uh, MIDI event data, but that's how it works. I've just completely ruined that pitch bend. So I'll go into my history and undo all of those edit operations in one go. So why is pitch bend data unusual? Well, it's an artifact of the MIDI protocol itself. MIDI specifies multiple different types of event, and one of them is pitch bend. In other words, pitch bend data has its own unique identifier in the protocol. That means that it's very stable. Pretty much every keyboard with a pitch bend wheel is going to transmit MIDI pitch bend data. Your door is going to understand what to do with it, and it works to, to such an extent that it's very rare to find a non-MIDI implementation of pitch bend. Most synthesizers don't have an automation equivalent to pitch bend. So when we come on next episode to talk about automation, you'll see that for the large part, it's kind of overridden and improved upon the MIDI protocol. Pitch bend is one of the exceptions. And it's one of the main reasons why you need to understand that MIDI is still there because for the most part, you are going to be dealing with it in this context, in this form. Now, all of this data, as you can see, has been recorded into the MIDI part. That's another intrinsic feature of MIDI events. They are recorded into MIDI parts and they move with the MIDI parts. You can see these little overlaid bars are my pitch bend data and they're traveling along with the part as opposed to automation data, which is recorded into the track. For something that we're not talking about today, we're talking about it an awful lot. But the purpose of today's episode is really to give us a foundation to understand what underlies everything and then we're in a better position to understand its evolution. Okay, that's pitch bend data. Now I want to record some continuous controller or CC information. Again, this is another feature of the MIDI protocol. There are 128 slots, continuous controller slots, numbered from 0 to 127 in the MIDI protocol. And they're basically communication channels. Imagine 128 independent streams over which any kind of conversation can be had. Now, by convention, many of those slots are already taken up. And in fact, if we go back to our controller list, these that you see down here are the most common, most standard. CC1 is usually mapped to the modulation wheel. Uh, 7 to main volume, 10 to your pan knob. Uh, 64 would be your sustain pedal if you've got that plugged into the back of your keyboard. These are absolutely standard, but they can be overridden. There's nothing stopping you going into your keyboard settings and overriding your sustain pedals controller and mapping CC64 to something else. Probably. Again, this is a very hardware specific thing. It depends on how easy it is to configure your hardware. And it also depends on how easy it is to configure your software to talk the same language. And this concept of conversation between hardware and software is the be all and end all of the whole thing. That's what we're talking about. I have a piece of equipment over here. I've got my native instruments machine. I use it as my generic MIDI controller. So I've got lots of knobs and buttons on this thing that I can use for all sorts of different purposes. Now I've got eight rotary controllers and I have them assigned to CC 102 to 109. The reason I've picked those particular numbers is because they're empty. In the standardized protocol, the convention-based protocol, where various of these numbers have been taken up, 102 to 109 is more or less universally free. I then have eight push buttons assigned from 52 to 59 for exactly the same reason. So what I'm going to do today is open up Halley and Sonic, get into the edit page, and I'm going to map this control here, the filter envelope, to one of the knobs on my hardware, on my machine. The way I do that is I right click, I say learn CC. This synthesizer is now in wait mode. It's waiting for me to do something with a piece of hardware, physical hardware. Move the knob, 
and there it's happened that's it it's done now that that's done Halion has immediately jumped out of learn mode. If I now move another controller on my hardware, I'm moving 108 now. Nothing's happening. Back to 109, there's my filter envelope knob being moved. Now what I've just done there is established a one-way communication route from the hardware to the VST. It's always kind of useful to bear in mind when you're talking about MIDI. Every single MIDI port is a one-way communication channel. It's possible to have two-way communication between a synthesizer and Cubase and from Cubase back to the synthesizer, but it's not implicit. So I've just created a one-way link from my hardware into the VST. And what that means is that I can now increase the cycle to my whole eight bars of the chorus, get the thing running, and I'm going to record some CC data over the top of those notes that I've already recorded. We're in merge mix mode here, so I can overlay as much data as I want. Okay, so I did one big ramp, and then at the end of the chorus, I had four and of little mini ramps. Normal behavior, not visible by default. We need to go into the controller lane menu and choose, here it is, CC109. Cubase knows that there's data on that track for us to view. As a matter of interest, if you click this little triangle button and say set up available controllers, you can specify any number of additional lanes that you want to be permanently visible. So now if I click the plus button, you'll see that CC80 is there all the time, regardless of whether or not it's got data. You might want that if you want to manually draw event data in. Remove the lane, and we do want to see 109. So here's my long ramp, and there's my four little pulses at the end. And there's all sorts of various ways that we can edit this data. I can pick up zones of it, uh, if I choose the middle, this little um, black square in the middle, if I choose that and it says scale vertically, if I move up and down, you can see that the whole thing scales according to the ratios between the various notes. Whereas if I choose anywhere other than that black little dot, I get move vertically and now everything is absolute and fixed. I can pick up the stuff at the corners and tilt them. I can pick up the entire zone and move it backwards and forwards. But in this case, I just want to delete that whole lot. Select all of the events, press delete, and they're gone. Now these four ramps at the end, I might decide, well, I quite like the sound of it. Here are my notes here. But it, it was a little bit sloppy on the recording. So let's do it manually instead. Delete all of that. This time I'm going to go to my line tool. I'm going to turn grid off so I've got nice granularity of these slopes and I'll do this kind of business see what that sounds like okay great stuff now if you remember earlier I said that was a one-way communication channel that we established from the hardware to the VST instrument prove that very easily. This time what I'm going to do is get the track running again in record mode, but this time rather than moving the physical controller, I'm going to move the envelope knob inside the VST backwards and forwards. Let's see what happens. So you can hear the envelope being manipulated. The VST is doing its job. But as soon as I press stop, despite the fact that I was recording then, we haven't recorded any data and the VST isn't transmitting data. It's the hardware that's responsible for outputting those continuous controller events and being recorded by Cubase. Now it is possible for VST instruments to output CC data, but that's not the default behavior and it's not the normal behavior. When you instruct a VST to learn, CC number, it's learning it for read-only purposes, not for output.
But that's not the only purpose of CC data. In fact, we can do pretty much anything we want with it. If we go into the studio options and have a look at studio setup, here you can see that I've configured my machine in Cubase. Now, the reason for this, we'll have a little bit more of a discussion about this in the next episode while we've got all of these not assigns. But basically, it's a nice place to remind yourself what all the various CC values are. And you can see here are all my rotary controls and the push button controls. This is all manually configured. I've actually created this myself. You can download stuff off the internet and some devices um, are pre-configured and you can just kind of load them in. But I've defined this myself. Down at the bottom, we've got three special instructions. Now the native instruments machine has transport controls and I've mapped three of them into Cubase. So here you can see play, record and stop. I'm asking machine to output these CC values. When I press the play button on machine, which I just did, and I'll just press stop. It's outputting MIDI CC values 60 and then 62. Cubase interprets this lower window down here, tells uh, Cubase what to do when it receives those instructions. So when it receives a 62 instruction, it's a transport command and it tells it to press start on the transport. P stands for push button. And then when it receives the 62, it interprets that as a stop command and does the business. And here you can see obviously record configured as well. So you can define MIDI continuous controller events to do pretty much anything you want. The list of available options that you've got down here is absolutely huge. One final point I'll mention today, just before we uh, call it a day, I'm just gonna draw an absolute mass of pitch bend data on this track. And because I'm not in uh, grid mode, it's recorded an awful lot of events there. Well, we can thin that stuff out by going into the MIDI menu, functions, thin out data. What that basically does is delete any event messages that are of the same value as the previous one. So you can see where we've got the, the very steep slopes here. It's going to leave that largely unchanged, but where I had a more gentle slope, there are going to be more instances where multiple notes, multiple events are at the same value. So when I choose thin out, it's just thin that stuff out. And now having zoomed in, you can see that no two events are identical. Just undo it. And it's put some of those identical events back in. Get rid of all that. So hopefully that's been a good introduction to the basics of communication between hardware and software. But as we'll see in the next couple of episodes, there's an awful lot that automation and quick controls bring to the party to make this stuff an awful lot easier to manage. Thanks very much for watching this one. Hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button, please, if you did. I'll see you next time.